Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so excited to have Dr. Blake Evans on today's show. Hi, Blake. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. And thank you for joining us. And I know it sounds really weird to be excited about talking about testicular sperm, but I must admit, I'm pretty excited about it because it's possibly something that can help a lot of people by knowing about it. But before we get into that, I want our audience to really get to know you a little bit more. So tell us about yourself. Sure. So I am from Oklahoma. Uh, I grew up here. I married, have two little boys. Uh, They are extremely energetic and keep me on my toes always. And they enjoy fighting me and each other always. Um, So I did all of my medical training in Oklahoma, aside from fellowship. I did undergrad and med school and residency at Oklahoma State University. Uh, just finished fellowship recently at National Institutes of Health, and I'm actually back in Oklahoma at the University of Oklahoma, which is the university rival of where I did all of my training at. So but I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> so I imagine patients probably remind you of that. They do, but I do have a lapel pin with my alma mater, so everyone understands that I'm from Oklahoma State, even though my coat says OU Physicians. So. I love it. Well, thank you for sharing about yourself. So what made you go into medicine and more specifically fertility medicine? So it's funny when I, when I was doing my rotations in medical school, I said I wanted to do anything above the waist is really what I wanted to go into. And then of course, went into OBGYN. I just really felt drawn to it. I really enjoyed the, the um, mixture of surgeries and deliveries and the, there's always excitement, never a dull moment. Um, but then I, re- I found reproductive endocrinology and infertility and just absolutely loved it. And kind of on a more personal level, my wife and I had to be seen by an REI. And so I was already undergoing my training and I found out about the specialty and on a personal level, as I mentioned, my wife and I had to go through um, treatment. So it, it, I just really, really have enjoyed being in this specialty and being able to help families. And uh, there's just always so much learning that's going on. And there's just the, the field's always changing. And it's just very exciting to me. So I've really mm-hmm. enjoyed being in this field. That's so true. Your patients are so lucky to have you. Well, thank you very much. So you've published so much great research, and this is not the only time we're going to have you on this show, but today's show is specifically about a very exciting, award-winning paper that was published recently about how to improve IVF pregnancy rates titled, Does Use of Testicular Sperm Improve Outcomes in Non-Azospermic Couples with Previous IVF Failure Using Ejaculated Sperm? That's a lot of stuff there to break down. Can you just break that title down for us? Sure. So basically, this study, there, there are prior studies to show that use of testicular sperm may in fact actually improve IVF outcomes. Uh, there's prior studies that show it could lead to higher implantation rates, clinical pregnancy rates, and live birth rates. Um, very limited, admittedly, and there's, this is kind of a, a hot button in the field of urology slash reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Um, So really with this study, we wanted to evaluate whether or not that patients or men that have sperm available, so basically they're not, um, they don't have a deficit in their sperm concentrations. They have had a prior IVF failure and without any obvious reason. And so this was a treatment that was offered to them, was undergoing testicular sperm extraction and see if this improves their outcomes. Um, But this study was entirely retrospective. So we were looking back at the outcomes that have already occurred just to see if there was an association with this. Got it. So how did you enroll patients in the study then if it was retrospective? So the patients were, it was just something that was offered with them. I worked on this paper in conjunction with a couple of uh, the urology specialists at Shady Grove Fertility, Dr. Shen and Dr. Tanner Cut. Um, but once again, it was just a treatment that was offered to them if the patients had failed prior IVF cycles and just no obvious etiology. Um, so they weren't per se enrolled prospectively. It was just, you know, going through and da- uh, looking through all the data and seeing which patients had had this treatment and then looking at the outcomes. Great. 
And can you break, I mean, I know this sounds like people should know when you're saying extracting from the testicle versus ejaculated sperm. Can you tell us the difference there? So uh, ejaculate sperm is typically what, how the sperm is collected prior to doing in vitro fertilization. Um, they have collection or collection rooms as we'll call them typically in the clinic in which uh, the male will collect the ejaculate in a cup and then that is used subsequently for IVF. Now with testicular sperm extraction, it's a surgical procedure where the patient's asleep and then there's a couple of different ways in which the sperm can be harvested, um, whether it be um, aspiration with a needle versus using a scalpel and excising some uh, little small area of the testicle and, and looking for sperm under a microscope. And the patient's asleep, I imagine, during that procedure. Definitely. <laughs> okay, good. So I imagine some people, if they're listening to this while driving, they might run into something <laughs> and crash their car. Absolutely. So guys, yep. okay, thank you. Now, for now I will say, now I am not urology trained and these are not surgeries that I do, but I, I believe that some of them actually will um, do them in office or if they are just doing an aspiration with a needle. But um, by and large, for all the patients in this study, they were definitely asleep. Yeah, and even if you're in the office, they do provide some sort of local anesthetic. Yes, definitely. Good. So what were the most important study findings? The most important study findings with this was that compared to, now these are, keep in mind, this is looking at a prior cycle that the couples have failed using their ejaculate sperm. And so now we're moving forward and looking at a new cycle whenever we're using testicular sperm and then injecting a single sperm into the egg or the oocyte. So compared to the prior cycle, and these were all considered cycle failures, meaning nothing got past a blastocyst or that stage of the embryo that we call blastocyst. So they didn't have a clinical pregnancy. So therefore they didn't have a miscarriage. Therefore they didn't have a live birth rate. So in comparison to their prior cycles, there was a statistically higher um, blastulation or formation of a blastocyst by about 30%. There was a higher association of um, blast conversion. So of the eggs that were fertilized, how many of them developed into a blastocyst. Um, there was a higher association of number of embryos available to freeze. And so if a patient has an embryo transferred and they want to try it for another child in the future or the first one did not work, they had at least one to two higher a number of embryos available to freeze. Um, but what's important to note about this study is we did look at clinical pregnancy rates. We did look at live birth outcomes, which are important aspects of the finding or uh, important aspects of the study. They were higher, so it was, it was you know, about 30% um, clinical pregnancy rate, or excuse me, about a 40% clinical pregnancy rate and 32% live birth rate. But we didn't statistically compare these to their prior cycles because that would be what we would call regression to the mean, meaning if we were to, because we didn't have a control group, and so that's a limitation of this study. So something that's very important to note is there was no control group in this study. But if you're comparing their prior cycles and looking at their, their next outcomes, is it truly an association with the testicular sperm and doing ICSI, or is it just by chance that we found this increased outcome? So we, we felt it wasn't right to statistically compare them. So that's something that's important to note. I mean, what I would say the most important study findings are that I can now have a bumper sticker on my car that says hashtag sperm matters. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's I mean, that's some of the, an addendum we should put on the paper. So <laughs> I agree. So why is it considered controversial that testicular sperm is associated with lower sperm DNA fragmentation? And I know you haven't talked about that yet, but why don't you talk to us a little bit about sperm DNA fragmentation, what it is, and what's the controversy all about? Sure. So a um, few things in regards to that. Um, so sperm DNA fragmentation looks at, there's a few different tests that you, or different ways to test this. There's different brands and different ways to look at it, but it's basically the percent of sperm that has damaged chromatin or the, the protein within the sperm head has damaged. And this is, uh, this has an association with adverse outcomes such as uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, um, poor IVF outcomes, um, and those, those being the main ones, and therefore decreased clinical pregnancy rates, decreased live birth. 
Um, but the controversy, if you will, is mainly in regards to the available literature that's out there. A lot of these studies are small in number, they're retrospective, they may or may not report live birth, um, so they're very heterogeneous in nature, and so there is not just a really good affirmative take-home note with all of these DNA fragmentation studies, except that people are wanting to know more about what else can we test on the male aside from just the, the semen analysis with the volume, concentration, motility, morphology, there's gotta be something else. So this is um, a very hot topic, I would say, in the urology field or infertility in general. And there are, despite there being a limited um, availability of, of literature and the outcomes, there are quite a few clinics that are starting to use it more and more often and finding some associations with positive outcomes and using it more frequently. So um, the most recent practice committee document from ASRM or American Society of Reproductive Medicine was about 2012, 2013, and they actually had summarized that the existing literature does not um, it's not consistent and they don't recommend doing this routinely on all infertile patients because the literature is, is not consistent. Um, so that's kind of the takeaway home from that, but it's been, you know, about seven years or so since then. So a lot of people are using it more and more and doing more studies. So hopefully sometime in the near future, we might have an update to that um, document. But basically, Long story short, the, the percent of DNA that's damaged, and it could be caused by different things um, intrinsically, so like oxidative stress on the sperm. Um, they could have inability to repair the DNA that's been broken, um, or external factors such as chronic sauna or hot tub use, or smoking, or gonadotoxic or cancer-related drugs, those things that can damage the sperm. So there's a lot of things that can cause DNA fragmentation or DNA damage to the sperm. And these things have been shown to be associated with decreased implantation, miscarriages, and uh, poor IVF outcomes, as I mentioned previously. So, so the controversy is more in regards to the available literature, what to do with the available literature that's out there. Um, and also there, there is good evidence showing that there's decreased DNA fragmentation in testicular sperm compared to ejaculate. But once again, what do you do with that information? And also you're probably not gonna find many men that are willing to undergo a prospective trial as to you can have your testicle cut on and you don't and see who has a better outcome. So it's a little difficult to assess it in that regard. Yeah, there would have to be, I don't know, some sort of huge incentive for guys to sign up for that, <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that would be a hard clinical trial to recruit for. There's no doubt about that. So that's right. great. I mean, basically, if you know what can cause elevated DNA fragmentation, then you just kind of listed what those things are. So guys can then know what to do to improve it, like eating healthy, exercising most days of the week, sleeping well, decreasing stress, and then also see a urologist. Absolutely. Definitely recommend that, seeing a urologist. Um, or, and, and another thing that's interesting about DNA fragmentation is the semen analysis itself can actually, it's been reported to be normal in up to 40% of men that have an abnormal DNA fragmentation. So everything else looks normal on their semen analysis, but they have an elevated DNA fragmentation. So, um, so that's certainly something you can discuss with urologists. Um, I've heard of them recommending over-the-counter vitamins, um, that might help out with this as well. But in regards to that, there's also not just a tried and true, this is what you should do for an abnormal DNA fragmentation. But it's certainly a point of discussion you can have with your urologist. So that's a great point. So up to 40% of people who have a normal semen analysis can still have an elevated DFI. Correct. Wow. Okay, that's really important for people to know. So thank you again, Dr. Evans, for coming on the Egg Whisper Show. Absolutely. Thank You're you. going to come back. We're going to do fertility Q&As with you. And you've published so much literature in the literature. And I'd love to talk about all your research. But before we sign off, can you tell us again where patients can find you? Sure. So I am once again at University of Oklahoma. Um, OUinfertility.com is our website. And there's plenty of information about our clinic, about me on there. Um, I am on Twitter. The, my handle is at mblakeevansdo. And um, soon forthcoming, I'll have an Instagram account as well that I'll be sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Good.
Good. You have to. Okay. Well, thank you again for your time. And Thanks thank you everyone for tuning in. And we look forward to having you guys back on next time. Thanks again. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadine. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 